Welcome to Dubai Real Estate Unplugged, brought to you by the team here at House & House Real Estate. I'm Luke Remington, Managing Director for the House & House Group, and today we're going to be talking to Grant Henderson, Head of Middle East at GC Partners. But before we jump in, let us know a bit about you, Grant. Tell us your story. What have you done? Where have you been? Hi, Luke. Well, here? well yeah. Thank- Hi, Luke. Thanks for having us in initially. Um, yeah, Dubai, I've been in for about 12 and a half years now. Um, again, one of those stories where I came out for a holiday and, and pretty much never went home, so... Yeah, ended up uh, coming over for a friend's wedding, two weeks seems, here. Seems to be in the, the sun and the old uh, story, doesn't it? People come out for a couple of years and end up staying longer than yeah, it well, initially expected. A couple of weeks in my instance, it's okay. been 12 and a half years now, so yeah. Um, but yeah, so obviously got into FX about, well, a lot longer than I'd like to admit, but about 22 years ago now. So oh, wow. yeah, I've been doing it a while, first initially in, in uh, the UK. Uh, before then, moving out here, doing about a year and a half on the ground here, funnily enough, back into real estate, because that was where I started my sales career, back at uh, Foxton's and Connell's in the UK, oh, wow. um, and then got back into, into FX. Okay, so interesting, actually. So you've been in real estate, so you know where we're coming from, our angle of things. Yeah, and you've yeah, got, got a fair exchange. idea. Brilliant. Okay, so Grant, why don't, for the listeners who don't know, can you give us kind of an overview of foreign exchange um, for mo- those that may not have a familiar concept of it? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 obviously there's various different aspects of foreign exchange, but um, the, the, the part that we sort of specialise in is mainly private clients. Okay. Um, we do look after corporates as well, um, but again, um, historically, companies like our own private brokerages um, that have sprung up over the years, certainly from the UK, have generally been built on these overseas property markets. Right, and okay. that's certainly where I cut my teeth initially, um, looking after large agents that were based in Spain. In fact, one of the largest agents that was based in Spain at that point, um, dealing with hundreds of clients every month from those guys looking to buy properties anywhere from Bulgaria to um, the uh, Costa del Sol. It seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't, foreign exchange wasn't something I was thinking about that much when I was in the UK in the state agency. No, no, it wasn't for me either at that point, no. So, but it has sprung up and seems to be a lot more common, whereas previously you go to your real estate broker, you'd buy a house, you'd employ a solicitor, a lawyer to look after it, but not many people talked about transferring money, and if they did, it tended to probably be through just a traditional bank, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly back then when I was doing real estate in the UK, it wasn't something I even thought about, yeah. to be fair. Um, so, yeah, the, you weren't looking to cross-sell, you were just obviously selling predominantly um, uh, secondary market and yeah just in your historic uh, well I was in St Albans at that point so, okay. um, nice part of the world in, yeah, yeah, just an established uh, city or town and yeah just resales so why wouldn't someone tend to just go to I don't know let's pick out HSB for example <coughs> like I did when I moved here in 2012 I had a, a little bit of savings that I needed to move over here and you just press a button there you open your account in Dubai with HSBC, it gets transferred over, you're comfortable, you know the brand. Yeah. So what is is this still happening lots or...? Yeah, look, there's nothing wrong with that. Look, the way I often try and get across what it is we do, it's 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 giving yourself another option. Um, I mean, you'll often shop around for things like insurance and um, mortgages mm. and obviously looking to get yeah. the best rate. And it, it's the same when it comes to FX. But again, if it's something you're not overly aware of, something you're not dealing with very often, if it's the first time, like you say, that you're moving a large lump sum, um, you don't look into it or you've never been introduced to anyone else, then obviously it's going to be more comfortable to use your bank. That's where you're going to go. And like I say, that's not the wrong way of doing it, but that's not necessarily going to give you the best return on your money or make your money go that that bit further as it would do with someone like, like ourselves. So people are more of fay with it now. You know, from, from a real estate broker's point of view, I feel we speak to a lot of clients that, okay, do you want to speak to the foreign exchange consultant? And they're like, why would I need to do that? Mm. So they are more of a, they're not kind of... Certainly kind of, here, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, when I was based in the UK and dealing with, obviously, the, 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 that t- that side of the market, then, um, yeah, it might have been the first time that they'd come across someone like us. So right. if it was their life savings or the, the, the first time they were looking to buy abroad or the first time they'd ever done anything abroad in this respect, then, yeah, the, 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 unless they'd been introduced to someone like myself, they'll just end up using the banks. <clears throat> Excuse me, but certainly from here, and having been here for the last, well, I took over here about 11 and a half years ago, um, I find the clients here are much more clued up. They uh, generally um, have used someone in the past, or they've already moved out here by the time we spoke to them, so they might have been introduced to someone like us, the other yeah. side of the water. Um, it, but it's much more common now. Yeah. So whereas yeah. before we'd speak to a client when I was in the UK, they'd never have spoke to a broker other than ourselves. I find here, I'd say 
50% of the time they would have used someone else or yeah. at least been speaking to someone else or been introduced to someone else. So um, clients are a lot more savvy, I'd yeah. say, in regards to that type of thing, yeah. And I suppose when you're moving home at the moment, you've got, you've got a lot of press out there about house prices. You've got a lot of press out there about negative global situations that are happening. And you've got a lot of press actually about crashing currencies, high currencies, this currency, that currency. Yeah. Um, what is going on with the currencies these days? <laughs> it's talked about a lot. <laughs> Even if you're not necessarily in it, it is talked about a lot. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they're the most, it's for the most volatile market out there. So it's always moved and moved a lot. I mean, what we've seen over the last few years with the likes of Brexit, which I always re refer back to when we're talking about big moves, uh, is unprecedented. We were seeing highs and lows that we hadn't seen for years or, or ever before. Um, I mean, going back to the Brexit announcement, um, when we decided to come out of the EU, once that announcement was made, the market dropped in its entirety over the course of the two weeks at the point of the of coming out and then the two weeks afterwards of, of around 22% wow. from top to bottom. And, and that's a huge move. Yeah, funny I enough, often, just sorry to jump in there, yeah. I actually remember a client buying at that time and they were concerned about whether they would stay in or they would stay out. Yeah. So it was a kind of roll of the dice yeah. and, you know, or a red or black situation. They decided to wait until the result, hoping that they would remain and the currency gets stronger. Yeah. And then what happened, obviously? So what yeah, you're saying it is it went, it did plummet 20 yeah, percent. It, it, it absolutely, yeah, absolutely, well, tanked for one of the better words. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, but I often refer that, obviously, when I go in and do the presentations to uh, obviously a lot of companies that we work with and the affiliates that we deal with, um, I often use that as a, 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 a scenario. Yeah. Um, if you've got a client that's coming out here looking to purchase a property, I mean, especially off plan, if they're staying based abroad, <laughs> you're going to put your deposit down, sign on the dotted line and work out roughly what that property is costing you for the entirety of that process today because that's the only figure that you can work from. You yeah. don't know what you're going to be getting over that two-year period. And that can work both ways. Obviously, it can go in your favour, and all of a sudden that property's costing you less than you initially calculated. Um, I've never had anyone pull out of a deal off the back of that. Obviously, on the flip side of that, if it goes against you, all of a sudden your margins are reduced and it's costing you more. Um, and obviously, if it's an investment property, you're purchasing that because the numbers work. And yeah. then all of a sudden, through no fault of your own, no fault of the agent, the market's just moved, and all of a sudden those numbers that were beneficial for you previously are now not or it's putting the property up to a, a degree that you can no longer afford. So using that scenario, you signed on the dotted line and then two weeks later, the portion of that property that you were moving, whether it's 100% or the 50, whatever it might be, um, has just gone up by 22%. Mm. But then isn't that just, I suppose it's kind of looking at Bitcoin and these green and red graphs, it's you, do you actually know? Can you give advice on it? You know, there must be so many questions like, Grant, is it going to be better next week or shall <laughs> yeah. I do it today? Um, I wish I could answer that one, but I probably wouldn't be sitting here if I could. So, um, no. What but we, you're in it, right? So you yeah. see it a lot more than, say, I do. So yeah. there, you've got to have a, a better understanding. But can it, you advise on it? No, we can't. We're not okay. regulated to advise on that. So what, you, for you, what? I can't even give my own opinion. To Under the Dubai regulations? No, we're an FCA regulated company. So um, obviously I have an office here, which... Um, obviously we market out of but everything we do trading treasury all of our banking even the registrations of our clients mm -hmm. are, are in the uk so yeah. obviously we adhere to the, the stringent uk yeah. reg, uh, regulations okay tell us about the dirham how is how is that as a currency um well the dirham is pegged to the dollar so and for those we, that don't know pegged because uh, i know you've got a lot yeah. of swings and pegs and spots yeah and uh, it, <laughs> yeah so basically the the dirham has pegged itself to the us dollar so it okay. tracks the us dollar um and is fixed to the the, the, the rate of, uh, or the value of the dollar um it's not the other way around so yeah. the us dollar isn't pegged to the dirham so they don't um they don't worry about that when they look to offer exchange for and cu and clients. countries would peg to that currency because it's stable, it's strong. Yeah, it's I mean, a global uh, currency, I assume. Yeah, pretty much now. Yeah, um, obviously, always used to be sterling because in regards to the time zone, we're quite central. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the the hub of trading is still the UK for that reason. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously, the dollar's the, the the major player. And would you say there's more between sterling and dollar, or euro and dollar, or? Aussie dollar. Well, those three, are, we look like a, a currency triangle, if you like. So okay. euro, pound, US dollar are all sort of interlinked. So you'll generally see them move together in, in certain ways. But um, yeah, obviously, often you can find all bets are off in the, okay. in the, the markets that we've been, been been accustomed to over the last couple of years. Okay. Especially. So you touched on that you're regulated. You touched on that probably your, sounded like your HQ is in the UK, yeah. um, which must surely give clients a lot of comfort that there's a lot of 
red tape and measures. Yeah, we're not just a company that's popped up here and, and obviously it's just trading yeah. as, as we wish. Yeah, like we've been in business for 20 years now. We've had uh, offices and uh, representatives here for just over 15, I think it is now. Okay. And would you say that you're kind of doing big numbers these days? Uh, yeah, again, just the, just, just off the, the uh, where we are here, obviously we've seen such an influx of people. Um, but again, my um, business is, is a little bit unusual in that it's not as affected by the markets here. Okay. Um, obviously, as we've seen with Brexit and a lot of people needing to, to leave the country, well, again, obviously that means a lot of people need to, yeah. to move funds. So we'll be busy in comparison to other industries because, again, yeah, people still need to use us. Yeah. Um, again, obviously money was then coming back in for clients that were then on reduced wages, having yeah. to move some of their savings that they might have moved out with us over the month over months because a lot of people are, are told not to leave too much money in the accounts here if you're saving up. Um, and again, that's nothing untoward. It's just obviously the, the banks work a little bit differently here in regards to obviously what they ca they can and can't do. Um, so yeah, interesting. It, you should touch on that. Do, do you feel that people? feel safer by transferring the money back to their own country and having it fixed there um or safe there is it I like that it's uh, well, basically the, the, the way the banks work here as i'm sure you know it, they, they work very differently to to back home so mm -hmm. if you move jobs or you decide to leave obviously they have various powers in regards to your account which we're not used to in yeah. europe yeah. Um, yeah nothing comes toward but mm -hmm. that's just the way the way the way it works here so if you have a credit card or a loan outstanding with them obviously the bank have the ability to then yeah. Take any funds that you hold on account with them if they see you've left your job and then obviously pay those debts off. Yes, yes. Um, so again, obviously a lot of clients that we deal with also deal with a lot of, of, of uh, IFAs and advisors and obviously their sort of rule of thumb is if you are building up lump sums, you're best off taking that offshore or putting that back in your home accounts. But again, a lot of people are here for a period of time. So it makes sense to do that anyway because again, the money's out of the way. Mm -hmm. If you're saving up, well, it's harder to spend it if it's not sitting in your current account mm -hmm. in the country that you're living in. So again, it, it's just good practice. Um, and obviously off the back of that, we find we have a l thousands of clients each month that move regular payments. Yeah. So we do everything from these smaller tranches yeah. of a portion of people's wages um, all the way up to yeah. our hedge funds that we look yeah. after. And I think the general mindset spend. in Dubai is that people now see it as a more of a longer term view. You've got the visas that have gone out, you know, 10 years. Yeah. People now probably actually think about retiring here now or spending the rest of their days here. So actually leaving your money in the bank here probably would be happening a bit more than it once did. Just um, could you tell us how much you're kind of transacting on at GC Partners or is that a no-no? Um, yeah, to, to drill down on what I do sort of daily monthly is quite difficult. But I mean, if we look at last year, we're still obviously preparing our, our, our accounts, but we're estimating in regards to the uplift that we've seen that will be around sort of 10 to 12 um, uh, Billion that will have been transferred. Billion dirhams? Uh, pounds that would have gone through our wow. system over the course of the last year or so. Okay, so, so that should alleviate, if anyone has got any worries, that they're dealing with quite a sizable. Yeah, and uh, again, on that note, obviously security or, or the safety of clients' funds is paramount. Uh, regardless of what saving you could be offered, be it by me or anyone else, obviously mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're comfortable and, and it's safe. So um, I often get asked that question by clients directly, and obviously I could say anything that I wanted yeah. to. So I suggest that they just go and do their own due diligence. Open source checks like we have to do obviously when we're registering mm -hmm. clients but you can obviously google us yeah. look for reviews and the best ones are the client reviews i mean mm -hmm. we're on a lot of the facebook groups here because again the expat communities are very small once you've been here for a particular amount of time mm -hmm. and if you're doing your job properly and you are giving the service that that we hope we are um we find people obviously refer people to us just through the facebook groups friends at work colleagues family members yeah um again as like i say if you if you do, do your job well enough then like I say, you yeah, get yeah. Off the have you seen it more in the last month where there's been some kind of banks go boom and you know there are kind of credit issues in the world have you had more resistance from potential clients saying grant am i going to send my money to you is it going to come out the other end have you seen it more at the moment because of no, what's going on no not really no. okay um again what we find is if you with those introductions and again even with the the um the affiliation that we have with the likes of yourselves and obviously other agents and ifas Again, as I'm sure people appreciate, you're not going to be willing to link yourself with us mm -hmm. had you not done your own due diligence, had you not been perf made yeah, yeah, sure, sure. That it, was, it was the right, right yeah, way to go. For sure. So we find that obviously has some some, yeah. uh, some cadence as well. Okay. You did touch on, you know, briefly, you know, why we should use currency brokers. But what kind of clients are you dealing with at the moment? Is there any particular nationalities that would be spring up more often than not. There's a lot of headlines in the papers at the moment about certain countries coming to Dubai 
Um, but you, is it just, I think it's a lot of clickbait out there just in order for people to, to read it. Yeah. I don't actually see it as the only savior to uh, the real estate here that there's a certain nationality coming in. But are you seeing more currency and more certain nationalities? Well, again, we've been here quite a while and a lot of our friends understand that we have certain restrictions in regards to what we can and can't do. Okay. Um, again, like I say, we're FCA regulated, so anything that's sanctioned, anything that's on, on mm. any no-go lists, obviously yeah. we can't deal with. Yeah. Um, so that would be anywhere that has any civil unrest, warring countries, anything like that. Um, and obviously there are certain countries that are just... A, a no go, so okay, for various different reasons. Okay, well, we won't touch on those countries, yeah. but I'm sure we could all imagine which countries those yeah. would be. But there are countries around the world that you know maybe you wouldn't assume have civil unrest or any kind of issues, but they're just it, do you get a certain list that comes to you every month that says you <laughs> cannot deal with them? Yeah, there is a list, yeah, okay, yeah, there is a, and it does change from time to time. Obviously, things go on and off, um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's certain things that you just can't get involved with yeah can't touch okay but again that's not to say that we can't deal with the clients from those countries so as much as a, a country might be sanctioned that's not to say that we can't look after a client that's based here that has no links with the country whatsoever mm. but obviously we have to then show that when we before we're entering into a, a transaction so we have to do various due diligence before we'll be happy to then proceed because the last thing we want to do is enter into a contract with a client bearing in mind most of these deals certainly on for the real estate are quite time restricted um, funds need to be in place at certain times otherwise penalties or yeah, chances yeah. of losing properties come in so we make sure we've dotted all the I's crossed all the T's before we look to enter into a, a, an agreement with a client for an exchange because the last thing we want to have happen through even through no fault of our own is there's any delay in the yeah. process because regardless of whether it's the banks either side of us it's a process that the client's entered into with us and again we want to make sure that's done as quickly as possible yeah yeah well we've dealt with you for a number of years now and i know there's been some quite a few successes we've had um and i say successes from a client's point of view of kind of thank you for introducing us to gc partners um and i'm not just saying this for the sake of the listeners but i genuinely don't think I've ever heard anything bad about GC Partners. Excellent. Um, someone did say they couldn't get in touch with you one day, but then I think that was because you were so busy <laughs> yeah. and it was one of those kind of Brexit scenarios where I think the phone was... We were all just fighting fire. Yeah. What was happening on that day? Uh, even I ended up getting back into the office and well, <laughs> picking up a, a phone and trading. So, really? Yeah, just so mental. It's been a couple of years, but it was yeah, to the point where we were staying till nine, ten o'clock at night just right. to try and get through everything, okay. um, get the callbacks done. But obviously we then also find it's not just fighting fire in regards to the clients that are registered. All of a sudden we have an influx of clients that then want to get registered to yeah. take advantage of a rate that's just been achieved. Yeah. And okay. yeah, it does tend to... Okay. Yeah. So a little bit hectic. Do you know any particular transactions, case studies with house and house that seem to pop out? Um, well, most recently, the largest one that we've done, well, I think, was just under 10 million euros. Wow. That okay. The, the client was exchanging. Yeah. Was he buying a house or selling a house? Um, I think he sold a house. No, no, he's buying a house. It was 10 million euros into the DMC. He would have been buying. Okay. Yeah. And that was in euros? Yeah, euros to the DMC. Yeah. Do you ever have any issues with language barriers? Because do a lot of clients actually see you? They're not, I'm not coming to see Grant. I'm not coming to see his his yeah, workplace. I, mean, I might get asked to come in and, and see a client if they're in, in situ. I mean, okay. we're based in the marina. We have a lot of our affiliates that are based there as well. So I'll often be asked to pop in and, and meet a client in person. I mean, especially if you're looking at obviously these larger transactions, it is nice for someone to have, have met someone in person. And clients are welcome to come in and do transactions with us literally in the office but yeah we are set up as a as any brokerage would be to be able to do everything over the recorded lines that we trade on so there's no physical need to come and see me um with houston it doesn't happen very often have people just wandering with the uh, rucksacks or carrier bags full of money to to exchange but uh, no that's something do. again we've never been able to deal with yeah. we're not a bureau to change it's bank to bank only for yeah us. interesting so there is a difference between me going and changing a million dirhams with Alan Sari or a million dirhams with GC. Yeah, you'd, so you'd the difference with that. Really? Well, to go in and put a million dirhams on a counter in. But like could you even Sari. do that with Alan Sari? I don't think you can now. Again, I, I've not tried it myself recently. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if anyone wants to correct me on that, feel free to. But, yeah, I mean, certainly from, from our point of view, the, the Alan Saris, and again, I, I even refer clients to them myself. What we don't want to be doing is, is transactions that are so small that it doesn't show a client, if that's the first time they're using us, the benefit of the service that we offer. Because on a couple of thousand dirhams, for instance, even if we offer a rate which is half the st the spread or the margin uh, of the bank or the likes of Al Ansari, the other end, it's not actually going to 
show you that much difference in, mm. in regards to what you're receiving. So then obviously if you're up against someone's bank to do those smaller transactions, that very small difference in, in what they've received on the other end isn't going to show them what we can do on those larger lump sums. But what we also do, unlike anyone else as far as I'm aware, still in the region, is we cover our clients' fees Okay. this side, um, which means even on those smaller amounts, even if the rate I offer you is the same as someone you're picking up elsewhere, those fees make up such a large portion of what you lose when you move your money. Clients are better off using us even if the rate's slightly worse yeah. on those smaller amounts with us through the likes of Alan. So yeah. you're still going to end up with more money in your bank the other end. Because yeah. this is often what we find with the likes of these these e-wallet and these online FX companies. Okay. You, obviously, you've got no one to talk to, which we find clients prefer having us at the end of the phone if there's an issue, if there's a delay for any reason. Um, and just a caveat there, it's normally with the banks either side of us. Right. But again, they can contact us and we can make sure that the clients are aware of the situation. We can find out where in the process we are. Um, and they've got someone they can speak to. Uh, whereas, obviously, if you're doing it with, the, again, not to mention any names, but these more app-based brokers, um, again, you're waiting for a, a response to an email, which you could wait for. And in some instances, as I know from clients that I've spoken to, a couple of weeks. Yeah. And yeah. these, it did actually happen to me about 10 years ago. I did. It was a very small uh, transaction, um, thankfully. But I did send money to, I think it was, a, you know, um, a small kind of going on holiday amount. But I do remember sending the money and then waiting, and then they didn't answer the phone, yeah. and then I Googled it, and then realised they'd gone into liquidation. Oh, my, okay. So, so do, do, do they come and go? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> that one did, obviously. Uh, but, um, I mean, I've not... I mean, I've worked for three brokers in my career, um, and not none of those have dissolved or, or moved away. I mean, the, the, as long... As, uh, Again, doing your homework. If you're dealing with a broker like ourselves, you want to be making sure they're not. It's not speculative in any way, shape, or form. So we don't speculate on the market. So we don't run the risk of the market going against us. We're doing transactions individually per client at that point. So even if I'm booking a trade for ten clients, doing dirhams into pounds, that's ten individual transactions that I'm booking with the client. But I'm also booking with my opposing or the platform okay. that we use and that, that transaction per client even to the point where if one of those clients decides they're not going ahead with it I have to sell that currency back to the market I can't move that even on to yeah, another okay. client so everything's ring fenced and it's yeah, per client okay. so we don't run the risk of buying a big tranche so what, what you're looking at there may have been this, this instance where obviously if you bought a large tranche of, of currency off the back of the rates being good but then the rates continued to go in, in the same direction all of a sudden yeah, you're stuck with your offside yeah. and then yeah, it's this how they're getting stuck. Yeah, that could, that could yeah, that could which is similar happen. to what probably happened with SVB Bank and you know with uh, the bond situation and the interest rates. And, on that. Okay, interesting. <laughs> um, Grant, what could you tell hmm. the listeners if they were trying to think is now a good time or should I wait? Are there any are there any things? I think interest rates would probably be one to yeah. ascertain whether currency is going to go up or down. Yeah, I mean, that's where we obviously get the question, when's the best time to do this? Yeah. Now, all we can ever do is look back and see where the market's been. So we have a few guides as to where we feel the market could go, depending yeah. on where the levels are and support and restriction levels that might be on the market. I mean, if you look at a graph, then you extrapolate it out over the course of a year or, or two, you'll see that there's often points along that where the, the, it's bouncing off of levels. Or, and there's generally support and resistance levels that are in the market. So we generally know, or as a as a guide, if you're obviously right at the bottom of a range, yeah. we'd need to see something happen to be able to then push through that and see new levels. So it's more likely that, again, as long as there's nothing going on in the world and there's nothing come, uh, that's happening that's going against the grain, then the chances are it's going to bounce and we'll see more moves Okay. back within that range. But that's not to say that's a guarantee, it's just a rule of thumb. And as you touched on there, interest rates. So if mm. interest rates hiked in a country, that would generally lead to strength, mm. because all of a sudden, again, with supply and demand, money's then being put into that currency because there's a better return on that yeah. money itself. Yeah. Bear in mind, obviously, everything that's moved. And again, figures-wise, this is an approximation, yeah. um, but if, uh, yeah, uh, the amount of money that's moved for the purposes that we're discussing here, private individuals, expats, but it probably makes up less than 2% of what's traded annually. Wow. So it, it, even if, if, the thing we used to, to look at was if every private individual traded on the same day, it probably wouldn't move the market that much, whereas you've got banks and yeah. and central banks and countries yeah. that will can move 
such large or vast amounts of money that it physically moves the market. Yeah, so. yeah, interesting. Um, there's been a lot of political changes. You know, you've got a lot of uh, prime ministers, presidents, well, and that's, changes. That does that, often does that move the market as okay, well? Okay, so yeah. if I was moving from Australia and I could see a prime minister changing, it, I could it could either go in favour or out favour mm. depending would, on who they pick. No, it's gen any change in leadership would generally just have a negative effect on the currency because there's uncertainty. Any uncertainty okay. leads to negativity. Okay. So um, there are exceptions to that sometimes. Okay. Um, Obviously, we saw in the UK that <laughs> Quite there was a, a, few a little changes. bit of a rally after a change, but um, yeah, ge again, general rule of thumb, it would it would yeah. lead to, to, to a little bit of weakness for a time. But the market would tend to feed these things in. So we used to have, I used to find a lot of people would wait for the interest rate announcement. Well, the market's fed in what it thinks is going to happen. So as long as that's come out or the announcements as expected. We don't, don't see much movement after the fact. It's only when it's going against maybe the double. It's a double hike, or it's uh, they, they move it when they said they're not going to move it. That's when we will then see the market react after the point or after the fact. Rather. You actually I heard something quite interesting where you said that it's kind of like trying to predict when you're in retail that if you're going to buy a, an item of clothing, but you're going to wait and not yeah. buy it. What did you actually mean by that? Well, it's, it's if you're going to wait for a sale, you don't know if that's going to come. I mean, you'd never buy anything. You'd never okay. do anything. So the, the way I look at, or the way I try and get clients to look at this is, regardless of where the market's been in the past or where it goes in the future, you've got the next two or three weeks to, to try and get the best out of, of yeah. your exchange. And that's impossible to know at what point that's going to yeah. be. So we'd often say to clients or, or try and get a customer, it's better the devil you know. We know it's a given rate today we can look back and see how that's fared in regards to the time frame that you might have had available but it doesn't matter what the market was doing last year you need to exchange your money today yeah. or this week or, or this month so regardless of the highs and lows that we've seen previously that's that's neither here nor there it's yeah. what's in what's ahead of you that you've got to worry about um, so I often again on these larger lump sums ask clients to, to put themselves in one or two categories would you be happier Taking a rate now that you know that, that you know you're going to get, knowing exactly what you're spending, and if it was slightly better near the time, so be it. But at least you protected yourself against an adverse movement in the market. Or would you like to gamble it? Which it, what it is is you're gambling yeah. by just leaving it to a, to the last minute or or, or, or whatever it might be, um, and taking a rate which is going to end up costing you more than it had done energy books it a week ago. So which would you rather? Yeah. How would you rather be sitting after the fact, taking what you know is available to you now and it, taking the safe bet, or I'm not saying the one's right or wrong because you just don't know. You could wait and, like I say, you could save yourself 3 4% yeah, if yeah. the market comes against you. But it's just luck. Because you're never going to know where that lowest point in the market is. You have until no idea, until right? Afterwards, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of Bitcoin owners that probably wish they'd sold at $60,000 rather than $25,000 <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. Is there, um, looking at what with what's going on at the moment, they're talking about a digital currency. Um, the UAE have announced it, and I'm not saying you're going to know a huge amount about this, Grant, I don't but know. do you um, think it's going to put you out of business? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's it, it's a funny one with these digital currencies. I mean, obviously, they're called digital currencies, but they're, I mean, for want of a better word, they're, they're not currencies. So um, until central banks adopt it across the board, yeah. then, I, yeah, it's not something that um, yeah. we, we're looking to get involved with. We find a lot of the banks, and certainly the banking partners we have, no, have no appetite for. Yeah. For, for binaries whatsoever. Interesting. Last question for you, Grant. If I saw a good rate today, yeah, and I thought, well, you know, over the course of the next year, I'm probably, other than buying a house or selling a house, um, I might have school fees, sure. I might yeah. have to be sending back savings or paying this or paying that. Yeah. Could I book that rate today? And okay. then, and I, so I can. And do I need to pay it all today or do I have the course of flexibility to do it throughout the year? There's various different ways that we can chop this up in regards to the, the, uh, the offering that we have, but we have what are generally class of spot and forward transactions that you can enter into. Now, a spot trade is what we all do when we change money up and on the spot transaction, nice and simple. Mm. Um, offered your rate, or you let know what you're looking to do, offered your rate, you take it there and then it's on the spot, it's done there and then. So like I say, it's what we all do. But unlike a bank, we can offer our private clients and our corporates what's known as a forward contract, which does exactly what you've, you've touched on there. This gives a client the ability to basically buy the currency now, but pay for it later. Um, it requires a deposit being paid initially. And again, depending on which way we're doing it, if it's done on a monthly basis, it might be a case of you pay the, so for instance, you wanted to lock the rate in today mm. for the next 12 months, you knew exactly what you were paying out, you know exactly what you're receiving. Um, and again, it's like locking yourself into a fixed rate mortgage. You know what you're paying now for mm -hmm. the course of that time frame. 
you're not affected by any ups or downs in the market. So it's not a guarantee of locking the best rate, as we've already touched on. Yeah. It's a guarantee of the cost to you now. Um, and in this instance, a client would pay the first and the last month's payment up front. Right. And then we'd obviously pay that out as we're receiving that standing order or that payment each month mm. from the client. And they're getting exactly the same rate, not affected by mm. the market, and that fund's paid out. So what we're in effect doing is we're going to buy all of the currency they need now. Yeah. We're going to hold on to it and pay it out over the course of that contract right. yeah. um, with then obviously that 12th payment or that last payment in this scenario we're already holding as a deposit and that's then just paid out without, yeah. any, without any funds from the client so that's how we do that on a regular payment if it was just on say a one off transaction so client for instance agreed the sale of their property now market's offering an exceptional rate dollars um, so strong again um, client wants to hold on to it well if the funds will be available two, three months down the line, you could look to, to lock the full amount now, you'd pay a 10% deposit, which could be paid in any currency, it doesn't need to be dirhams, that can then be refunded um, at the end of the process, but we hold the 10% deposit as the initial down payment, and then 90% is paid at the point of, of, mm -hmm. of uh, completion, yeah. and then obviously those funds are made good. But like I say, it doesn't guarantee the best rate, um, again from a business point of view, it makes no difference to us if the market goes up or down within mm -hmm. that time frame, because we've physically secured the currency at that rate at that point, it's the only way you can lock yeah. A rate of exchange is by physically securing it. Um, obviously, that doesn't, or, or that sometimes, or clients won't have the ability to do that because the funds aren't available. But this only requires a ten percent down yeah. payment to do it. Yeah. No, I think in that, that I think that's what you're touching on. Basically, is people have to accept it. It's like buying a property. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to pay that price. If it's more in six months, great. If it's lower in six months, what can I do? I've already bought it, and I think that's if you're happy with that rate today. Yeah. You've just got to suck it and see. It could go up, yeah. it could go down, but you, you've, you've committed. Yeah, and again, you're not going to lock in, as, as, as I often say, you're not going to lock yourself in at a level that you're really not happy with. So the market will lend itself to whether it's even worth you looking to do that. Or like I say, from the company standpoint, um, regardless of what the rates are doing, this just sets your margins. So yeah. obviously if you're purchasing goods or services from abroad, um, especially goods that you've got a markup on, you've got your margin, um, again, obviously the exchange rates can eat that pretty quickly. So we find a lot of our corporates will fix in for those forward contracts for mm. periods to six to 12 months, just to make sure that their bottom line isn't eaten away by something that's completely out of their control. Grant Henson, thank you ever so much. I know you've made a lot of clients um, happy at House and House. Uh, you've done a superb job. Um, you're very strong. And I, you know, I'm sure there should be people that speak to you, even if they've got a long lasting relationship with their bank <coughs> manager and they go for a uh, game of golf with them and they think they're getting the best deal. I always would suggest um, just having a quotation. One thing that I really like about you guys is there is no sell. And like you say, is if you don't like us, go away, do your Google reviews, check us out. And, you know, just if you're happy and comfortable, you can move forward with us. So thank you, Grant. Really interesting. Thanks for having me.